Welcome everyone. I am Joe Andrews from UDA Health. And thank you for joining us for today's webinar at the front line of COVID-19, how leading health systems and payers are addressing severe financial and operational risks. I will hand it over now to Sam Glick, partner, Health and Life Sciences at Oliver Wyman, who will lead today's discussion. Sam? Terrific, thanks Joe, uh, and delighted to be here today. I'll start today with a bit of an introduction uh, on how we view the ever-changing environment as it relates to COVID and, and what providers and payers are having to do, uh, not only to survive, but to support consumers uh, in a meaningful way. And then we'll have a discussion, and I am uh, really excited about the group of people we've brought here Today, we've got three people uh, who have really been on the front lines of helping New York through this crisis. Uh, Rich Miller, EVP and Chief Business Strategy Officer for Northwell. Uh, Dr. Jerry Brogan, who's the SVP and Chief Revenue Officer. And Jordan Vador, who comes from Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield on the, on the payer side. Um, you know, we've got the payer in New York. We've got the largest health system in New York. Uh, and they've, they've been struggling through nearly every aspect of this and, and doing so well. I think we'd say. Also have to be joined by my friend Seth Cohen. Seth is co-founder of UDA Health, uh, who has been working with these organizations and a number of others uh, to streamline how, how we make payments work throughout healthcare. Um, we'll get to that conversation in a minute. Uh, before we do that, I want to jump in with a little bit of a view of where we see things headed. And we'll start with kind of a long view and then uh, zoom in on what it means for the next couple of years and what it means for healthcare. Uh, but when we talk about COVID-19, at least at first, it was tempting to talk about it as a crisis, as a one-time event, that COVID-19 would come through. We were going to have uh, a lot of casualties, both um, health casualties and economic casualties. Uh, but then we'd come down the other side of the recovery curve and we'd be okay. And when we think about other crises in historical context and how they went from being just crisis events to being history-making events, uh, we looked at two things. Uh, one, how long did they last? And two, what percentage of the population was directly affected? And that's what starts to influence how much are we actually gonna see generational habits change? How much is this not just 9-11, where people stopped flying for a period of time, but a few years later they were back at it, and it's the Great Depression, where we actually changed the habits of a generation long after the crisis had passed. And this is not scientific. We don't know how long COVID's gonna last. We don't know um, what percentage of the population is directly affected. But we know, as you can see in this chart, we're moving into this range of this being a history-shaping event. And so as organizations, we have to start to think about not just how we weather the next six months, year, two years, but really how do we reshape ourselves in the, shape, in, in the face of everything you see on the right of this page. Whether that's risk aversion and economic conservatism, we know for example, that people who got their first jobs during the 2008 financial crisis to this day are more conservative investors and make different kinds of spending decisions. It starts to shape people's psychology. We already have employers saying people are going to work remotely permanently. Big announcement by Twitter yesterday that that's an option for their workforce, and I suspect we'll see more of those. What it means to be a gig worker, what it means to be retired. If I can work from home like this, if I can work digitally, that frees up all sorts of trapped capacity. Women on maternity leave, people who would have otherwise been retired, people who would have been disabled, people who maybe thought three or four hours a day was all that they could do around their lifestyles. And similarly, the kind of attachment that you have to one employer just gets accelerated. Sadly, um, we were just in the last year in a point uh, where racial and ethnic minorities in the US uh, had gotten to an unemployment level that was back to pre-2008 levels. And we're already seeing that the last into the job market are the first out with the layoffs. And so there is a chance that this reinforces inequality in ways that, as we think about healthcare professionals, just doubles down the emphasis on things like social determinants of health and how we engage people in a way that's relevant to them and their culture. Um, what does it mean to live in a city? Is it as valuable to live in a city when you can work from anywhere, be anywhere? Is the great home office in the suburbs the new craft room or man cave? Uh, is that how you think about what you're building? Would you put your parents in an assisted living or a skilled nursing facility, having seen what you saw in the COVID crisis? Or are we gonna have bigger houses and people living there? How do we think about large groups? How do we think about getting on public transit? 
what does it do to commercial real estate, shopping malls and big buildings with shared ventilation? Does digital not just become the ancillary offering, but what's first? What are new social norms? Will we ever handshake again? Will we ever blow on birthday cakes again? Uh, how do we think about you know, what it actually means to engage with one another? Um, what does it mean to have personal space? And how do we think about that with one another? Um, are we going to see a preference for global travel, local travel as opposed to global travel? And then politically, we're already seeing some anti-globalization sentiment and some, some very kind of um, both positive and negative views um, that are going to shape how people vote and how they engage civically. And we don't know which ones of these are going to be true, but organizations, and particularly healthcare organizations, if we're building big hospitals, if we're building big medical office buildings, if we're thinking of telemedicine as a supplemental offering, not as the primary offering, if we think about an employed workforce as working some minimum number of hours, if we think about a medical group as being physically based, if we think about our solution for the aging being about residential facilities versus what you can do in place, those things might not hold. We think about our footprint as being around today's population centers, not where people might disperse to. Those things might not hold. And then if we go to thinking from thinking long term to thinking about the next two years or so, um, we're in this long haul of suppression now. We are coming down, at least in the US, on the right side of the first curve. We're seeing some recovery. We're seeing restrictions lifted. But we are, until there is a scale therapeutic or a vaccine, going to have peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs, surges and not, surges and not. And those surges will happen in ways that are not evenly distributed geographically um, and may surprise us in some places and not in others. And what that means is that as healthcare organizations, we're going to have to think about what are our local relationships like, what are our state relationships like, and how will we cope with seemingly random changes in local policy and what we're able to do. If we think about our workforce, some, are some of our employees will be ill, others will just be quarantined, could be 20% plus. How do we use them? What do we do with that? The better we are at telemedicine, the better somebody who's quarantined but not ill can keep working. How do we think about engaging in that way? We're gonna have the mental health and well-being challenges that we're all seeing, unprecedented rates of anxiety and depression uh, already coming out of this crisis. As I talked about unequal economic impact, the people we serve and the people who work for us are going to have very different needs, and we've got to be able to address those. And then we're going to have changed customer behaviors. We were all just talking before this webinar about the fact that just because we relax restriction doesn't mean the volume comes back, whether that's in the emergency room or the hospital or we're seeing some data. It's been 10 days or so now. The states that have relaxed restrictions on restaurants, restaurant volume is still down 80 or 90 percent. That's consumer behavior, that's not the restriction. And we've got we've to adjust for that in healthcare. And then when we think a sort of across industries, and ultimately we're all in the B2B business. You know, the, all the profit and then some comes from commercial business and that comes from industries that are employing people. Um, we're seeing some real GDP hit, particularly in industries like manufacturing, retail, food, beverage, hospitality, entertainment, recreation, and these are the places that employ a disproportionate number of the people. And so for the payers in the audience, it's not just about what's happening to unemployment overall, it's what hap what's happening to my book of business, what's happening to the industries that I serve well. Do I do more of the yellow and green dots on here or more of the red dots? Same thing for the providers. What does my town look like? Who are the big employers? Where are people getting their coverage? What are the knock-on effects? And you start to see that through employment. And then of course, this hits healthcare um, especially hard. These are the, the April job numbers on this page. And this is a temporary situation. We don't know if this is going to get better or worse. And there's lots of speculation out there about what's going to happen. Um, but we're getting hit really hard in healthcare. Um, we are seeing after um, hospitality and professional services and some of the labor intensive businesses, the 1.4 million jobs lost in healthcare. And many of those jobs are in ambulatory environments. Many of those jobs are in places we wouldn't have thought of. Half a million of them are in dentistry, believe it or not. A lot of them in independent providers. And that creates both opportunities for big systems. How do we want to support those opportunities for payers? Uh, but also challenges when it comes to access and how we think about people on the front lines. And then if we broaden to healthcare and think beyond that, 
it's really a mixed bag. You know, we know that for providers, we've got the single whammy now and the double whammy next year. Single whammy now is the profitable elective stuff was displaced by COVID care or just went away. Next year, we hope that consumer behavior changes, but if it doesn't, we still have the double whammy of mix shift uh, and of everybody moving to government pay. When we think of kind of middle of this chart, um, you know, some of the pure plays are in an interesting place. We are seeing spikes in telemedicine that are unprecedented. But if you're a pure play telemedicine player, what that means is that next year, a lot of the big incumbent players are gonna start taking this seriously. So you either gotta differentiate yourself or you gotta sell or you gotta be done. Chain drug, same thing. Temporary spike, we're seeing the chain drug stores hire tens of thousands of people. They're essential merchants. merchants. They're doing testing that's gonna drive growth. They will be doing vaccination. But if people move to digital first, what does it mean to be a physical box? And how do you think about really being digitally driven? Health plans are gonna have a disproportionate impact. It's a good year this year. Uh, if uh, you've got MLR that's down and your membership hasn't changed yet, but next year it's gonna be all about how well you do in the individual and the government business. And some of the regional plans are not as diversified into that as the national health plans are. And then health IT, pharma and med device are kind of the arms merchants to this whole thing. Um, so goes capital spending, so goes hospital volume. So goes health ID and pharma and med device. And of course, it'll be the usual dice game of some of the pharma players will do really well as they participate in the COVID economy, um, but others are gonna see some delayed demand. And then one, one last page before we dig in, we are hugely sensitive in this business to unemployment, not just our own, but to others, and we all know that. Um, mm -hmm. But we've got 50 plus million lives in play if we stay at the unemployment levels that we've seen come out in April. That means people moving from the highly profitable commercial business into individual, into Medicaid, and into the uninsured. And anybody who doesn't have a strategy to say, how do I actually lose less and start to figure out an alternate model for Medicaid? How do I play materially in the individual market? How do I think about seeing uninsured levels come back to the point that starts to look like we were talking about pre-ACA um, in some cases um, is fooling themselves. And we've gotta be working on those kinds of strategies now and figure out how we fundamentally not just change who we select and who we bring in, but how we engage them and how we deliver care for them differently. So that's a bit of a Cook's tour. I'm sure we'll get into these topics in detail as we dig in. Um, but I might, I might shift gears for just a moment uh, because we started at a very intellectual level. Here's what the industry looks like, here where things go. Uh, but we got people on, on video here uh, who've been living this at a very personal level. And maybe Dr. Brogan, I'll start with you. Uh, you're, not just, uh, you're not just an administrator, but you're actually a physician uh, and on the front lines in one of the medical practices. What's COVID been like? Well, it's been um, both a tremendous administrative challenge and also drew me back into my clinical days as a emergency physician and emergency management uh, leader. Uh, I was asked to help stand up one of our field hospitals uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers and the Department of Health. So we took over a, a state university nearby, their soccer, football, two baseball fields in their gym, and uh, worked with the Army Corps of Engineers, um, National Guard, Department of Health, and FEMA uh, in two weeks to stand up a thousand bed hospital, which um, unless you were a member of the soccer, football, or baseball team was pretty inspiring to see. Um, about 500 contractors, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, working in perfect synchrony uh, to create 600 foot long tents, 100 foot wide, heating, ventilation, plumbing, uh, generators, new roads. Uh, it, it, it was just uh, tremendous. Um, brought up a lot of revenue cycle issues as to you know, how these patients would be tracked and uh, what medical record would we use, uh, how would they be billed. And it kind of highlighted uh, for me that anything we can do in the revenue cycle space to simplify what we do uh, even pre-COVID would have made things a lot easier and been one or two less things on our checkbox to have to worry about as we were uh, standing up this, this 1,000 bed field hospital. And um, <clears throat> I think for me, it, um, it's a tougher environment for patients to get care. Um, 
family couldn't be at the bedside. And I think anything that we can do, one of the things I took away from this is whatever we can do to preserve the patient experience, clinically, administratively, uh, will have value going forward because it's gonna be a new normal for sure. Yeah. So, so Rich, I'm gonna guess that you probably didn't have in your capital plan building a field hospital. <laughs> what's happened to your plans and what's been your experience here? What have you, what have you been spending your time on? But from my perspective, uh, it's been the most challenging period in my career. Um, I mean, first and foremost, serving, you know, the community that that's in need, but also, you know, at the same time, trying to keep our staff safe. Um, you know, obviously the doctors and the nurses and the respiratory therapists and other frontline caregivers were at great risk. Um, and we went to great, a great extent to provide all the necessary PPE to keep staff safe. Um, but a, a component that we don't often think of, and, and Dr. Brogan mentioned the revenue cycle, we, we had over 100 of our frontline revenue cycle staff that did test uh, COVID positive during this period. Yeah. And so that created a number of challenges for us in terms of redeploying staff and obviously taking all the steps necessary um, to keep people safe on the front line. Um, just to give uh, a sense to the audience of, of, you know, when we say that we were in the hot spot, just to kind of give you some numbers to put around that, we either, either tested or treated over 40,000 COVID positive patients uh, across our health system, including over 14,000 inpatients um, during the period. Um, we peaked um, around April, I think it was April 12th, um, at over 3,400 in-house COVID positive patients across our hospitals. And in order to accommodate that, because those patients have such long lengths of stay, we took extraordinary efforts to increase our bed capacity by over 50% across our hospitals. We even did things like take auditoriums and take all the seats out of the auditorium and stand up medical surgical units within, within those uh, auditoriums. So a lot of effort, a lot of kudos to our team, emergency management team, our facilities team, and obviously all the clinicians um, to be able to respond um, to the great influx of, uh, of patients. Um, from a financial standpoint, it's been extremely challenging. Um, we are actually still under a restriction um, in our part of New York State um, to perform any elective or routine services. Um, so the COVID population in our hospitals has declined significantly. Um, although we're not yet out of the woods, we're at about one third of where we were at the peak um, in terms of COVID hospitalized patients. Um, but the cost to care for these patients is, is very significant. Um, they have about three to four times the length of stay that we would see in a typical med surge patient. Um, and we're incurring significant costs related to labor, um, supply costs, and equipment. So overall, I would just in, in summary, I would say this has taken a significant toll, um, obviously on our populations and on the organization uh, in terms of lives lost, um, suffering, and also the financial impact uh, to our organization. Yeah, yeah. Seth? How about you? You're, you're running a small business solving some big problems uh, yeah. in the middle of this crisis. I'm still looking for the playbook on how to run a small business during a global pandemic as a first-time CEO uh, while also doing small children in the house. I haven't found that playbook yet, but I'm eager to find it. Um, at the same time, though, um, you know, all joking aside, I, I'm very grateful um, that we are in the line of business that we're at to support payers and providers like the folks on the phone who are on the front lines and to help them drive some of their mission critical priorities has been energizing for the team. I mean, it's definitely turbulent. You know, we've had to make some hard calls in the company. We have to focus in certain areas that maybe we didn't think were going to be top of mind before. Um, like, for example, um, really doubling down uh, and thinking about the product value we are creating versus thinking solely about, not really thinking solely, but not just thinking about adoption, broadly speaking, but how are we really de delivering deep product value to our current um, customer base has been, has been mission critical. Um, and I also think about, you know, we started this company with this vision for removing administrative friction um, in, in between payers and providers so that we could focus more on patient care. That was our North Star. And I'm at least grateful that that's as relevant as ever. And some of the folks like Rich on the phone have been helpful in educating us on the new implications of that mission, you know, ways that we need to evolve from where we started in order to serve that North Star best. Yeah. Jordan, uh, sort of in that spirit, and then I'll, I'll ask you also to transition us to, to talking about some of the specifics. What has this meant for you? And then I know Empire has been doing a lot to support providers. The, the data that I showed suggests that for health insurers, this may be the calm before the storm. 
and that the membership storm is coming, but I know you've been doing a lot already uh, to try and keep everything running. Yeah, and uh, it's been a very interesting time uh, to be stuffed in the apartment working from home. And, and, you know, first of all, by the way, thank you for giving me the excuse to put on collared shirt for the first time in three months and feel Happy. somewhat human again uh, at, at work here, technically at work. So, um, you know, I, and, and so I happen to live, you might even hear the, the sirens, the ambulances in the background right now, directly next to the Brooklyn Hospital Center, which is a tiny little uh, independent hospital here in, in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. Um, and so I watched literally from my window as about two months ago, they stood up all the testing tents and all the temporary sites down there in their parking lot. Um, people dressed up in, in, in obviously uh, appropriate protective equipment and, and gear. And uh, it was only about maybe maybe three weeks in that I, I took a walk on a Saturday, obviously with my mask and appropriately uh, dressed to, to go outdoors for a couple of hours and walking past them, uh, got closer and, and realized that, you know, th these were not all testing sites, actually about half of them uh, were morgues. And it was just such a chilling kind of uh, a dose of reality around the situation and, and how serious, you know, taking it from just numbers in a spreadsheet, you know, uh, working in our offices as a payer to uh, uh, the, the depth of, of, of what this really looks like on the front lines and what our, our partners at Northwell and the rest of the provider community are, go, are going through out there actually uh, in, in the day to day of all this. So I, I more than acknowledge, um, you know, the difference uh, and, and, and kind of magnitude of, of what everyone in the different scopes of this industry are going through. Uh, and, you know, Anthem, as we, I think, asked ourselves a little bit, not philosophically, um, if you will, it's, it's too early in the day for me to get, you know, super philosophical, but, you know, what is our role yeah. um, in, in a crisis in a pandemic like this? You know, we're not the, we're not those people I just described, you know, we're not the, the, the nurses and the PAs and the hospital workers and MDs, you know, out there with, um, you know, uh, I think he said uh, 40,000 uh, COVID patients is a crazy number. Um, and so, you know, what kind of a role can we play in, and, you know, is it a, a mask donation? Um, you know, we, we've gone and, uh, and obviously honored, um, waiving premiums, uh, for a period of 60 days for many of our clients. Uh, and, 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 and obviously nobody is, is, is hoping to leave anybody out without insurance during this, uh, this strange time when, when it's most needed. And, uh, I think what you're referencing, Sam, is uh, we just took a, another step forward and announced last week uh, we'll be issuing a series of, of advanced payments to uh, hundreds uh, of, of um, independently owned provider practices throughout the state and, and across the country, um, practices who simply can't afford to keep going uh, the way things are. And, and, you know, hospitals have obviously substantial material financial challenges and, and turmoils of their own right now and talk i'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that throughout this presentation but uh was, was just really proud and, and happy that our company stepped up and is out there partnering with those independently owned entities uh to try to bring them through this time of uh, of, of change and, and toughness into obviously what should be a more stable period as uh new bed days uh continue to come down yeah yeah so, uh, and building on that, Rich and, and Jerry, I think there's lots of awareness, uh, at least in the in the among the general public, of the clinical and operational challenges that healthcare providers have been facing. Uh, to Jordan's point, there's increasing awareness of the financial challenges that this crisis has created, um, but there's a lot of administrative challenges that I think don't get discussed often enough. Um, you know, what the the so-called paperwork, but that's actually the grease that makes the place run. Um, can you talk a little bit about what what that part of the challenges look like and what you've been doing? Yeah, so I'll start, uh, Sam, and then and then hand it over to Dr. Brogan. Um, one of the things that we saw early on um, through some of the regulatory um, pronouncements that came out relative to cost sharing, um, and then followed by some some regulatory changes on the federal side. And then there were, as, as I'm sure everyone's aware, some of the plans decided to cover or to cover the cost sharing on more than just the testing, um, but certain plans agreed to cover the, the cost sharing relative to treatment as well. And early on, there was a lot of confusion around this issue. Um, you know, some plans were covering certain things, some weren't. 
So we made the decision early on to stop point of service collections on cost sharing, and then further to hold any bills um, to patients after we received um, the insurance um, portion of the payment. If it did indicate that there was a, a patient cost sharing amount, we took the time to go back to all of the plans to make sure that their adjudication of the claims was correct because all of this was happening so rapidly uh, it was difficult for for the various payers to configure their systems to eliminate the cost sharing on the COVID testing and or treatment um, as may have been applicable so we've we've basically um, in order to protect consumers and and to not send out bills um, in error for cost sharing we've held back on collections of point of service and on sending out bills until we're sure in working with the payer that any amounts for cost sharing that we're invoicing are in fact accurate and appropriate. Yeah. Jerry, you wanna add from the administrative standpoint? Yeah, just some other administrative challenges. A lot of our financial counseling work was a lot tougher to do uh, just to get in to see a patient, uh, particularly if they were COVID positive. Um, there were a lot of coding changes to catch up with, uh, some grouper updates that came in and uh, all of those were important to get on top of because we were using those codes to help identify the COVID cases to know how to handle those accounts versus a non-COVID visit. So it really involved all front, middle, and back parts of the rev cycle uh, to get up to speed quickly and to make sure those accounts were handled correctly while still doing whatever, quote, normal work was still in existence. Yeah. Any, from either of you, New York, unfortunately, was was clearly at the front of this crisis, and you at Northwell got hit pretty hard with it. Um, but we have a lot of providers in the audience that, that, frankly, have not seen a lot of COVID volume yet. But when we go back to that chart, that second curve, that third curve, that fourth curve, they very well may. Any advice you have for other people, uh, maybe in your roles, but not in New York, um, who who haven't seen the worst of it yet? I'll, I'll start, Jerry. I, I think um, planning for the necessary labor and supply resources. Um, you know, you, you're probably going to need to redeploy folks from any ambulatory settings and supplement staffing with, with whether it's agency um, uh, resources. Um, but we had to do a tremendous amount of work ar around redeploying, redeploying labor resources across the organization. Dr. Brogan pointed out how he was redeployed to lead up um, from a clinical perspective, the, the standing up of a, of a, of a remote hospital um, on a college campus. I mean, that's one example. There are, there are literally thousands of people across our organization who were redeployed, including quite a number of people who work in our revenue cycle who have clinical backgrounds, nurses and doctors um, who were redeployed back into the field um, to deal with this. So, you know, getting ahead of that and not having to, to react um, being proactive about getting those staffing assignments in place. And of course, you know, stocking up as much as possible on the necessary PPE, I would say those are really critical items to uh, to be thinking about now before the surge comes. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that as well, uh, we were fortunate in that we were planning uh, to increase our capability to work from home because of hazardous weather you know, being in the Northeast with snowstorms, et cetera. Yeah. And so we had just completed that wave of preparation and that was really critical and being able to move quickly uh, a lot of the revenue cycle team to work from home and to still maintain uh, almost normal productivity. And I think if we hadn't done that, there would have been a lot more scrambling and a little more uh, stress in trying to keep the revenue cycle Float. Yeah. Seth, uh, building on that a bit, um, I, I think about this situation and everything Rich and Jerry just described from the point of view of a consumer who might have symptoms they don't understand and they're terrified of, yeah. or suddenly to the point about consumer behavior, scared to go in and get care. Um, they're getting it, conflicting guidance from their health plan or in the media or from their employer about what might be covered and what might be. And then suddenly they've had their income cut or they've lost their job. So they feel more economically vulnerable than ever before. And that's a terrible place to be in when you think you need care, you're afraid to get it, you don't know what's covered and a surprise bill um, might actually be more devastating uh, to you than it would have been a couple of months ago. 
how does UDA help with that and what, what have you all been doing? Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, grateful to support these partners on the line and others that we're working with. Um, so for example, in California, Blue Shield of California announced a $200 million relief package, not unlike what Jordan mentioned, um, but where they're, um, they're asking us to step forward as part of that relief package to accelerate some of the work we're doing. So more specifically, Sam, to your point, what are we doing? Uh, well, one is, is, as we noted, you know, the consumer has always been in between a health plan and a provider when it comes to a financial relationship, right? We, we kind of, we, we, we deposit that consumer right between these two organizations and we're doing our best to stay coordinated and, and communicate, but we're not, we're not coordinated, right? You know, and I don't think I'm offending anyone on the line when I say, you know, Anthem, like any payer, will send out communications with this is what you owe, this is what you should expect. And then Northwell will separately, like any provider, send out then information about this is what you actually need to pay. And that has always been a disjointed and confusing yeah. process. But now for the reasons you just mentioned, Sam, it has become even more distressing and complicated. And so what we believe, and are grateful that the partners on the call share this belief, is that we really need to streamline and remove some of that confusion by focusing the financial relationship through one entity. And so one of the things that we feel very compelled by is that this idea of outsourcing financial management to providers and asking providers to handle that on behalf of the payer does not make any more sense yeah. than a restaurant when one day we can go back to restaurants. Um, you know, imagine if a restaurant had to outsource all of that work to a collection agency and the collection agency sponsored by the restaurant chases for bills. And so we think this is now the time more than ever to relieve the providers of the burdens that, uh, that Jerry and Rich are talking about and to have a consumer really focus its financial relationship with the payer, right? To be able to say, okay, I know that the payer is going to be the single source of truth. They're going to send me all the information I need to know about what I owe. They'll set up financing options for me. And I'm not going to be ping ponged in between the, me, the payer and the provider on what, what's going on. Um, yeah. That, that's that's what we see here. That's great, great. So Jordan, are you are you an anthem and empire a, a believer in what Seth just said, and what are you doing to make things uh, I'm, easier? In, in in addition to working obviously in provider contracting for a big payer, I'm also a human being, a friend of many, and a family member. Uh, and I, like most of the people I'm sure on on this webinar and panel, uh, are, are at many times during dinner conversations the the subject of threats. And, uh, and accusations about how, how complicated and complex uh, payment, claims payment and, and trying to digest and understand an EOB might be. I'll also you know, fully acknowledge many of the COVID uh, regulations, temporary, temporary rulings, temporary mandates, and even just payer decisions that happen on the fly, like we're talking about waiving co-pays and how we're going to reimburse for telehealth. A lot of that stuff went into effect the day that it was announced. And so inherently, you're going to screw up claims payments. You're going to have EOBs that process, you know, incorrectly. And it's going to be a, a substantial uh, reconciliation effort when all is said and done. And trust me, that's, that's half of my, uh, my inbox is, is hearing rightfully so from providers who are, who are flustered and frustrated, you know, not just with, with Empire and Anthem, but, but with the industry in general. And so it's been hard to uh, use a cliche here, right? Uh, you know, the tire changing the tires while the, while the car is moving. Um, it's been challenging to keep up. I think we're finally getting to the point where things are now uh, beginning to pay and process correctly, although clearly still waiting a, a fair amount of guidance on, on COVID reimbursement uh, and claims in that sense. But in general and, and separate and aside from, from this pandemic, uh, you know, the, the reason that we're we're, we're partnering with UDA and, and, and looking to invite in new mechanisms to join us in that component of the patient journey is because I think our company from our, our president down firmly believes that we can all do better and that putting the patient in the middle of that collections process uh, is, is, should not be a part of this system that remains a problem uh, for, for as long as it has. So I, I certainly don't have the solution other than I'll give a little commercial. I think companies like UDA uh, have figured out a nice mousetrap uh, and that there's, a, there's certainly a better way for us to all work together so that the patient isn't the, uh, the sacrificial uh, component of that transaction. Yeah, amen. Um, Dr. Brogan, I may, I may go back to you and, and broaden our conversation a bit. Uh, you know, I talked at the beginning about the shift to telehealth, kind of permanent shift in consumer habits 
Um, what, what permanent changes broadly might we see at Northwell uh, coming out of this and, and going forward? Well, we, we had started a journey of telehealth um, for very different reasons. It really started with telepsychiatry because of lack of availability of um, psychiatry resources, clearing patients uh, from the emergency departments and them having to sit sometimes for two or three days until we could uh, do the appropriate evaluation and get them to a psychiatric facility. So we had started up in the telemedicine space um, and we were uh, in the process of broadening that. Uh, we have a tele-ICU program now, a tele-stroke program. And we were in the early phases of testing in internal medicine offices. And this has just put that program on steroids. We now are doing 4,000 telehealth visits per day across Amazing. the health system. Uh, you know, there's 23 hospitals, about 720. 20 ambulatory practices. And so uh, this number one put the program on steroids, obviously, uh, created a lot of challenges to get these platforms up, to in-service the doctor, to get the policy and procedures, to know how to bill, what to bill, who to bill. But I think um, telemedicine is here to stay for a number of reasons. Uh, one is for safety uh, in the COVID and whatever comes next climate. Uh, the other is really convenience for patients, compliance. There's a lot of patient navigation, which I think is critical to reducing the cost of healthcare, is assisting patients in how they care for themselves and using telehealth platforms is going to be critical. Um, but it is a challenge. You know, as a physician, it's very challenging to do te telehealth. It takes more time because you don't have the ability to examine a patient to the same degree. Right? You can ask them to do range of motion. You could potentially, with some sophisticated devices, listen to the heart, but you can't uh, examine a patient the way you normally would. So you rely on the history, and you've got to spend a lot more time on the history to be able to feel comfortable that the direction you're giving uh, is, is correct. Uh, you've got additional costs now in all these offices for the platform. It still takes an office to do it in. So I think it's going to change our model uh, significantly and what the right mix will be of telehealth visits to office visits for a given practitioner. Uh, we're not sure where that falls out and how that changes actually physician compensation. Um, yeah. But I think telehealth is going to be an important tool for all of those reasons. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, the net impact is that we can actually provide better care to more patients in a more convenient and safe fashion. Uh, but this clearly was an accelerant. Uh, like nothing I've seen, I've been, you know, in practice post-residency for 30 years, and I've never seen anything in medicine move this quickly as telemedicine. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been amazing. We're hearing these stories all across the country. Uh, Rich, the, the flip side of what Dr. Brogan just shared with us is that we've got patients who are not necessarily coming in for the care that they need. We want them to come back in for the care that they need. Um, and at the same time, as there's a shift to telemedicine, places like Northwell now have to be nationally competitive because if I can click and, and interact with a Northwell physician, I can click and interact with a physician anywhere. How are you thinking about bringing people back in that environment where you're probably more in their home than ever before, but you're also competing with more players than ever before? Right, absolutely. And, and you know, one of the things that we are doing right now, even though we're not allowed to reopen yet for elective and for routine services, um, we're outfitting all of our practice locations, our ambulatory locations to be, I'll say, safer environments once we do reopen, putting up plexiglass where needed, spacing out chairs in, in waiting areas, um, obviously stocking up with all the necessary PPE. So we're getting ready for when we do get the go ahead to reopen that the office locations are safer environments and that, that our patients are more comfortable coming back in when necessary. As Dr. Brogan described, not everything can be done um, via telehealth. Yeah. So there will be a need to continue to have on-site um, availability um, for patient care. The other thing that we're doing um, on the administrative side is, uh, and Dr. Brogan alluded to this, we, we have thousands of corporate employees who are working remotely currently were able to do so because we had prepared through the ha hazardous weather plan that Dr. Brogan described. 
we're evaluating whether or not we can do that on a longer term basis for portions of that corporate staff and, and have them be able to perhaps not 100% work remotely, but predominantly work from a remote location. So that's something that we're currently evaluating. And I think there will be some changes on that front. And I know we're not unique um, in that regard, looking across the country at other industries. Yeah. yeah. Now it's going to be an interesting change as we see everything from, you know, as you mentioned, where people want to work, how they want to work, what's the physician value proposition. Can being a physician be a work from home job now? Um, at least in some specialties, there's a whole set of changes and then the whole cost structure around it. Which employees do you need and which buildings and which ones do you not? We've got a number of questions in the Q&A and I'd encourage anybody uh, listening or following along to add to them if you want. We'll get to a few. Should we take a couple of them? Yeah. Yeah? Sure. Um, Jordan, we've got one here for you. Um, it was kind of a scramble uh, and Anthem and Empire and payers across the country had to figure out quickly how to reimburse for COVID and uh, deal with that situation. But if COVID is gonna be endemic for a year or two and we are in this long haul, how are you thinking long-term about reimbursement for COVID and, and bringing some clarity to the situation? Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I would say long-term to be determined. Sorry, that's not a, a terrific answer for, I guess, the, the person who's asking or the audience today. You know, in the short term, there are codes and, and obviously groupers that are, as, as Dr. Brogan mentioned before, you know, DRGs that are being triggered that are getting reimbursed. I think it uh, you know, comparably, you know, whether it's to sepsis or other, uh, I guess you could say other comp comparable diagnoses. Uh, and, and our company, much like others, are, are, are handling many of these claims as individual cases. You know, we're not mass processing them. We're, we're reviewing them. We're learning from them. And I think cobbling together what, what we view our uh, longer term reimbursement uh, assessment to be after many of the current and temporary regulations on how payers are instructed to process COVID patients uh, are lifted. And so many of these are 90 days here in New York and they will go away. And at that point, it is, uh, it is not necessarily a blanket um, uh, directive on, on how, and, how and where um, these codes should be reimbursed. So and it's not a very precise response uh, that, that specifically acknowledges a dollar amount or a CPT code to reference, but uh, certainly tell you I'm on uh, multiple conference calls uh, every week on the very topic, and and we will obviously figure that one out. Yeah, yeah. No, it's we're we're all figuring it out as we go. Um, Rich, I might I might shift to you. Uh, we've got a question about um, your relationship with the government, and particularly public health agencies. Uh, I think public health, particularly state and local authorities, became uh, more important than many of us realized uh, through this crisis. What's that relationship been like, and and um, how are you working with them? So uh, our CEO, Michael Dowling, um, has been very active and the governor has appointed him to either lead or participate um, in a number of task forces um, that are addressing the issue. Um, we, the, the State Department of Health has been in constant contact um, with our organization and other healthcare providers um, as we've gone through this period. Uh, I think they've responded very well um, and, you know, I think um, Jordan made a comment earlier about sometimes, you know, notices went out um, or regulatory changes went out and how to be responded to immediately. And, you know, that's created a challenge for everyone, you know, both payers and providers um, to deal with some of those things. But yeah, I think given the magnitude of the crisis, um, you know, particularly in New York um, and in downstate New York, um, I think the state uh, has handled it well and they, they've been open to getting suggestions um, from providers. Um, and I think they've worked well with, uh, with payers and providers um, in terms of responding, again, in a very rapid fashion um, to something that I think, you know, two and a half months ago, most people didn't see something of this magnitude coming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jerry, I might, I might take the next one for you. You talked at the outset about um, standing up the field hospital and that story and what's been going on inside of Northwell facilities. But one of the tragedies of, of this pandemic has been what's happening in nursing homes and other post-acute care facilities. What do you see as the implications of this for post-acute and how that landscape might evolve? So great question. I think there's a couple of things that uh, came up as a result of this crisis that um, <clears throat> 
those involved in case management and utilization review uh, would have predicted. Uh, and there were a couple of themes here. One is just efficiency of the process. Um, how long did it take to get a COVID negative patient? Let's, let, let's yeah. take the simplest case out of your hospital in order to create capacity for COVID positive patients that were coming in. And this highlighted all of the inefficiencies in getting authorizations um, and uh, transporting patients to, to facilities. Uh, so I think we have learned a lot um, as a health system and, and I think as a state and as a nation in how to best move patients in and out of hospitals in order to create capacity when we need it. Now, uh, that being said, we also have learned, and there was a little bit of a change in New York State where initially nursing homes weren't taking COVID positive patients back who were clinically stable. Then they were asked to do that because we needed to free up capacity within the hospitals for patients that were COVID positive, intubated, needing ICUs, et cetera. But what it did was it highlighted that most nursing homes are not set up to handle patients who may still be infectious to the way that they thought they would yeah. or wanted to be for a variety of reasons. Uh, the size of the rooms, the ventilation systems, the PPE they had on uh, site, the training of the staff, the medications that they had available to them. And I think this has highlighted the need for us to rethink that because you are gonna to need to create capacity for those that are the sickest and have those that can be in a lower intensity site of care go to those sites of care. Uh, but we're gonna to have to make sure that those sites of care can handle a subset of patients that they have not been used to handling. Right. Uh, so again, it's almost like a load balancing of the entire healthcare continuum that we need now to look at as a holistic uh, entity and not just how does a hospital get a patient out their door to another building, and then that building is sort of tag your it as to how you manage those patients yourself. Um, not that there was the intention, but to some degree, we were more siloed than I think we realized, particularly for challenging patient populations. And I think we're gonna learn a lot from this experience and it's gonna set us up in, in a lot um, stronger way for anything that might come down the pike. Yeah, we've gotta make it a real continuum and not just handoffs. and keep moving in that direction. We're coming to the end of our time. Seth, I've got one last one in here that I might turn to you uh, and let you wrap us up. Um, there's a lot of interest in a few of these comments in this idea that we simplify the collection of copays and cost sharing and uh, let the payers do that. There was even uh, an article in Health Affairs that just came out uh, about this concept. Do you think that the little bit of momentum uh, we've gotten through COVID is gonna continue and, and where do we go from here? I, I do. Um, I do see that momentum continuing. Um, I've seen an acceleration um, in the work being done with payers and providers across the country, um, not just in New York, but like I said, in California, other markets, Arizona as well, where we are seeing um, kind of a returning, returning that responsibility back to the plan and relieving providers of this collection burden. Um, I do believe that we'll see continued momentum. What I'd add to that, though, is I want to be clear, the way that at least we've been engaging in these conversations is it's not, it's not just this singular, very narrow transaction, like, let us pay you back for those collections and we will take it over. Thank you very much, yeah. shake hands and leave. It, it, where I've seen it most successful is it's part of a broader conversation on, you know, how do we, the payer and provider, remove some of this unnecessary administrative friction broadly? Collections is one piece. But there are other sources of friction, whether it's sharing medical records or prior authorization. And so I, I do think we are seeing momentum, but I also think it's part of a broader view on where are other places where patients are stuck in between payer and provider processes where we can create more simplicity. Um, and I just wanted to note that that more holistic view, I think, is, is also taking hold. Yeah, I sure hope so. It's more important now than ever. Rich, Jerry, Jordan, Seth, it's been a pleasure. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Uh, and for everybody listening, thanks for joining us. Uh, I know a few people have asked uh, if the materials will be available. We'll make the materials available. We'll make a recording available. And I know that uh, all of us are happy to continue the conversation if people want to do that.